February 23rd, 2006. This is an interview for the oral history collection at the UAH archives. I'm Charles Lundquist. Today, Robert Spencer is with us. Thanks, Bob, for, for being here. For the record, can you please give us a short summary of your career, where you spent your youth, where you went to school, and how you got into the space program here in Huntsville? Should I go back to birth? If you want to, if you remember. <laughs> I was born in Northport, Alabama in 1931. And uh, from there moved to Miami, Florida. Lived there for seven years. Back to Tuscaloosa. Then to Mobile. Back to Tuscaloosa for a year in college. And then to New Orleans. And from there went into the Air Force for four years where I uh, was a jet engine mechanic and um, went through pilot school. From there, I came back to the University of Alabama and uh, received two degrees, and one in mechanical engineering, one in aeronautical engineering. And from there, I went to Pensacola, Florida to work for Columbia National Corporation. Uh, we manufactured zirconium for the uh, Atomic submarine program. Oh, really? Interesting enterprise. Yes, and from there I went with Boeing in uh, at Michou, and near New Orleans, as um, in the uh, facilities department, and helped to to design and install the 33-foot boring vertical boring mill, which was used to manufacture the wire rings for the Saturn V uh, moon vehicle and um, designed and installed um, a load testing fixture at Michu, which would do the proof loading for the forward handling ring for the S1C stage. And from there I moved to Huntsville and uh, with Boeing and uh, transferred to NASA in 1964 and worked in the Quality and Reliability Assurance Laboratory for about four years and then transferred to um, program development under Dr. Lucas and uh, was a study manager for several studies there, the uh, tethered satellite system and the early studies on the legios. And after doing the, the phase A and phase B studies on the legios, then Frank Williams, who at that time was at NASA headquarters, asked me to come there and be the program manager. That was in 1974. You were at NASA headquarters then through the uh, the launch of the satellite? Yes. Yes, uh, I was program manager at NASA headquarters from 1974 to 1976. We launched the satellite in May of 1976 uh, in the Delta rocket uh, number 123. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, I guess the most significant thing about the Legios project the Legio satellite itself is that it will be in orbit more than 10 million years. And it's still being observed. As you know, it's yes. one of the longest playing uh, satellites that NASA will ever launch or be associated with, I suspect. Yes, and we, we put a plaque in it to, to indicate to some future being who finds it there where it came from when it was launched and why it's there. And, and the plaque was uh, designed by Carl Sagan. So. If I remember correctly, Legios was one of the fastest and cheapest satellite, or most inexpensive satellite programs that NASA ever did, is that yes. correct? Yes, uh, and as a matter of fact, I didn't use all the funds. I had to turn back in about a million and a half dollars and almost got fired for it. I don't suppose anybody else has ever done that, have they? No, no. <laughs> they wondered what, 
what I didn't do that I was supposed to do. <laughs> Were you involved at all in the plans and then the launch of the second Legios by the Italians? No. Uh, McDonald, McDonald Douglas uh, out of uh, uh, Denver was going to be the the integrator for the second uh, satellite, and uh, no, that's wrong. Scratch that. <laughs> um, I was not involved in uh, in the second launch uh, of the Italian satellite. But there was a second launch, and it was as successful as the the first Legio. So you're also unique in that. There aren't very many satellites that get copied by another country and then and then launched. And an identical copy of Legios yes. was done by the Italians. Yes, it was. And I understand it was it had a, a little bit different uh, objective, and that was to study the gravitational field rather than the motion of the plates. Well, it did both things actually. Yes. Were you involved in the? Planning, or what do you remember about the planning for the tracking and the meetings at Goddard uh, on how to track the satellite? Very little. I was involved. I did interface with those meetings and that planning, but um, we were we were strapped for funds in the budget as those uh, ground stations were being planned. And I think NASA only funded two ground stations. And they were not funded under the Legios program. They were funded under the CSAP program. I see. So that you didn't have to worry about getting the tracking done then? No. That wasn't part of your responsibility? Yes. The, the Carter Cube reflectors on the satellite were quite a project. Do you have any recollections of the travails in getting those built? Yes. Um, we uh, had to do quite a search to find uh, silicon that was pure enough. And we finally found a, a, a supply in Germany. So the, the pure silicon that was used to manufacture the cube corners came from Germany. And they were... Um, Silicon dioxide, I guess. It's the, the, the glass. It was a yes. silicon glass. Yes. There were also some infrared corner cubes on the, on the Legios. They posed a still different problem. Yes. Um, Dr. Charles Towns. Yes. Uh, requested that we put uh, a number of those uh, cube corners on the satellite so that he could uh, do some work with the CO2 laser. And we did, and, and I think that uh, proved to be a satisfactory arrangement. With, uh, Charlie Towns being a Nobel Prize winner, one yes. was inclined to try to accommodate his request, yes. as I remember it. <laughs> And, and in fact, they were used, as I under, understand it, some years after the launch, but they have been used. Yes. And I believe the Italians did the same thing, so it would be, be identical. Well, did you have to set up the uh, analysis plans, or was that done under a different program at headquarters? That was done... Uh I think entirely at Goddard, and uh, was not involved heavily with that. But we did, we did encounter some some opposition to the Legios program uh, relative to the data and its purpose. Um, about that time, the global positioning system concept was being finalized and the early stages of development were taking place. And there was quite a bit of operation, uh, uh, quite a bit of uh, opposition to even launching the Legios because 
the global positioning system would do the same thing better later on. But we over we overcame that and went through the launch. I might just mention that Legios is the first and maybe maybe not, uh, but almost uh, to this date the only artificial satellite that required the use of the full general theory of relativity in every aspect of its operation, in its orbit determination, in its, in its tracking, and in the position of the global stations on, on Earth. And they all had to be done with the full general theory of relativity. Yes. You, you gave some people a severe challenge when you launched the satellite. <laughs> yes. The engineers on that project that had to apply the full general theory of relativity were, were in some pretty deep engineering. I think they still are. Still are, right. <laughs> well, what did you do when you finished the, uh, your tour at headquarters in the LAGEOS program? I was transferred back to the Marshall Space Flight Center and um, was the uh, chairman of the source selection committee for the tethered satellite system. And after that was completed, I accepted a position with the Space Lab program in Germany as the resident manager there, and was in Germany on that program for close to four years. How did you find interacting with the, <coughs> the European Space Agency on that project? It, it was, it was very interesting, and, and it was a delightful experience. What city were you in? Bremen. That's where the the hardware was integrated in Bremen, at Erno. Mm -hmm. so there were ten European countries involved in the uh, uh, European Space Agency at that time, and each one contributed something. And it was part of uh, my job to to sort of integrate that activity and make sure everything came together and that it um, would support the requirements of the shuttle. So they brought in an American to coordinate the Europeans then, huh? Yes. <laughs> At least you were an impartial uh, manager. Yes, yes. Um, there is a difference in the way they approach things that I found, and that is that they approached uh, this project from the standpoint of the letter of the law, the letter of the contract, the intent didn't matter. It was the letter of the contract. And I might give a couple of examples. Sure, go ahead. Um, part of the Space Lab program required that you launch or put in orbit experiments that were on the pallet and not in the manned module. And if the experiments were on the pallet, then we had to... Back in the cargo bay of the shuttle. Yes. We had to furnish the appropriate uh, uh, electronic hardware and computer systems and telemetry on the pallet. And that was housed in a, in a, a little a metal container called the igloo. And the Belgian people were manufacturing the igloo. And we tried to get them to put in a, a negative pressure relief valve. So when the igloo would, the orbiter would come back into the atmosphere with the igloo, that it wouldn't collapse. And, and they, they said, no, we're not going to do that. Because, let's see, here's the contract right here. It says, we only have to put up a good one. We don't have to bring back a good one. <laughs> did you finally get it put in? Yes. <laughs> I imagine you did. <laughs> oh, when you came back from Germany, what did you do? I served as the uh, as a system engineer um, in the space lab uh, with Jack Lee, and retired a year later. Hmm. That was before Jack Lee became center director. I yes, think. yes, yes. I retired in August 1981.
about the same time I did, as a matter of fact. <laughs> yes. Well, any other recollections of your days in the space program and at Marshall that you'd like to share with the world? I can't think of anything of any significance. Uh, there are a lot of little anecdotes here and there, but... Uh, well, did you have fun? Yes. Yes, it was a great experience. And, and I would do it again, given the chance. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for coming, and we enjoyed having you this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Well, well.